welcome to part two of my 14 bolt rear steer axle build. As you saw during the first video, I'm trying to be as detailed as possible without running the video too long. Unfortunately, building a rear steer axle from scratch and getting it to work is a very long process, which results in a long video. Also, an unfortunate reality is that you'll probably spend most of your time waiting on parts like I did. In part one, we basically built a rear steer axle. In part two, we're gonna be getting into subject matter that you won't find anywhere on the internet, like actually plumbing in your rear steer, making hoses for it, and setting up your directional control valve. We left off in part one after my gears were set up, and that's exactly where we're, where we're gonna resume in part two. So I hope you enjoy the video. Well, these bearing retainer cat bolts right here take 135 freaking foot pounds to torque. So get prepared to put a lot of torque on these. I recommend a big torque wrench for that. And, uh, you know, if you haven't been turned on to this brand Precision Instruments, I highly recommend them. They make all Since this is a brand new housing and a brand new diff cover and the mating surfaces are, are basically as perfect as they're going to get. I'm going to try to use a lube blocker gasket and see if it'll hold. Basically, uh, in my mind, this is lube blocker's last chance to seal a diff. If it doesn't work on this one, I'm pretty much done with lube blocker for good. I don't know, man. I'm kind of digging the Halloween color theme here. You know, that's the same orange I used on my buggy, but it uh, looks a little brighter. And um, I don't remember if I forgot to tell you guys or not, but uh, I put these little Mac tabs in here. That way when I hook my buggy up to my trailer, I just get my Mac straps and boom, click it right in there. Literally ready to go in seconds. So rather than have to wrap straps around my tubes anymore... I just reach over and snap it in, and I'm ready to roll. So, kind of cool there. Really glad I added that. Okay, I got my upper and lower links on. Axle centered out. And it's looking pretty badass, man. Now for one of the most important, crucial, and potentially costly aspects of the build. It's time to measure for custom axle shafts. You'll need to be very patient, do your research, and probably get a buddy or two to come over to confirm your measurements to make damn sure they're right. I'm going to have custom 300M RCVs made for this axle. And RCV has a great custom axle builder order form on their website, so go check that out. You need these measurements to be exact when you order for custom axles, so you don't waste $3,000 on axles that don't fit. First of all, you need to measure inner shaft length. Because you need to measure a line between the center of both kingpins, I like to use one of these telescoping magnets and basically uh, stick it to the center top of the top kingpin and then line it up with the bottom kingpin right there and basically I'm going to use that to measure center kingpin off of. Now stick a tape measure through the C's. Next you'll need to measure spline length. Some spools have three inches of splines and some carriers have less than two inches of spline engagement. The Grizzly Locker in this axle has exactly two inches of spline engagement. So you need to measure your spline engagement. And lastly, you need to remember that 14 bolt axle shafts don't come factory with an axle seal service right, surface right here. You know, it's basically a rear application axle, so there's no axle seal on the, the inside of the tube. So don't forget that your 14 bolt axles, rear steer axle shafts will have to have a sealing surface built into them to properly seal the axle tubes. You saw earlier in this video where I'm using the Crane Revolution 14 seals in this axle. So that makes it very easy to get this measurement 
uh, in their center section. You could see that this stock 14 bolt axle shaft has absolutely no sealing surface. So the new shafts I'm having made uh, at RCV are going to be made with a sealing surface, you know, uh, that's similar to your typical steering axle. And that brings us to stub shaft measurements, which are going to be super easy. Since I'm using common GM Kingpin Dana 60 outers, I'll be using common GM Dana 60 stub shafts, you know, which uh, are commonly 12 inches from uh, the uh, center of the uh, yoke hole uh, out to the end of the shaft right here. I believe they're, they're 12 inches for the Dodge and GM Kingpin Dana 60, so it doesn't get any easier than that. Well, remember when I talked about those uh, upper mounts on the buggy that I need to uh, cant inwards and lean back a little bit? Well, I'm going to go ahead and uh, fire up the plasma right now and uh, cut those off. Get the get them cleaned up and re-welded on in the correct orientation. And as you can see here, I removed and smoothed out the old mounts and uh, I'm ready to put some new mounts right in this node right here where it'll be real strong. So I got these shock mounts up now. The upper shock mounts are done. I recessed them in a lot and uh, shortened them up a little bit and uh, we're uh, just about ready to mount the ORIs back on. Well, it's getting closer to complete. It's closer every time I go out into the garage to spend an hour or half hour or two hours on it just to get a little bit done at a time. But uh, just an update, it is actually coming along. You know, and get this sucker on the jacks here and <clears throat> flex it out to make sure you have clearance everywhere. You know, a real important aspect of clearance is between the bottom of the shock right here and uh, either your ball joint or your kingpin cap. You know, because uh, remember, you shorten this axle tube a lot, so you had to move this mount out far. So you want to make sure that clears right there. Often overlooked spot. So I took my seats out. Uh, I'm going to get them reupholstered and uh, put in some new harnesses. Those harnesses that were in here were almost 10 years old and saved me through some serious rollovers and backflips and everything. So time to take those harnesses out and put new ones in. But one of the big problems I'm running into is, you know, it's pretty tight in here. I have a pretty narrow buggy in the, uh, the cab here. And uh, I really don't have anywhere to put my rear steer valve. So I'm going to build a little uh, center tunnel right there. And I'm going to mount my rear steer control valve on that. Try to make it look clean. But that's pretty much the only place I can mount it where it will be out of the way. I mean, it's already pretty cramped in here. Buggy life. So I'm in the process right now of fabricating up a little uh, tunnel right there in the center to put my rear steer controls and maybe my winch controls too. So fabbing that up right now. So the tunnel's coming along, and uh, what's cool about this tunnel is it's complete bolt and removable. So let's go ahead and uh, start to skin this thing. Well, I got the directional valve and the rear steer joystick mounted up right there, and it's a perfect fit. Have all of my levers basically in 
one easy to grab area right here so I can manipulate it. And then I'm going to put a, uh, an emergency kill switch right there and my winch controls right there to round out this little tunnel I'm building right there. So it's coming along. So I'm fabbing up a center console for my rear steer. And uh, you can see on my directional control valve joystick, I got a boot on here. And all I did was uh, pull this old throttle cable from the junkyard. Actually, it's a shift cable for a transmission. Pulled it from the junkyard, cut it, took the boots off, and uh, made boots for my little shifter. So I think it's going to turn out pretty good. Got my winch controls right there. And right here in the middle, I'm going to put an emergency cutoff switch. And uh, I think right here on the side of uh, the joystick, I'm going to put a little center indicator there. So see how that goes. So that's kind of the rough cut of what my little control tunnel and my center console is going to look like right there. You know, this is real rough. I need to refine it up a little bit and uh, put my return to center indicator in there. But uh, kind of how it's going to look. Okay, so over the last couple months, I really did my some research into pumps for my rear steer system. And I actually got to try out a couple of rigs that had the uh, um, electric over hydraulic rear steer. And they seemed to really like it, but when I tried it, I don't know, man. I really didn't like them because uh, they seemed pretty slow and... You know, both the guys I tried it, they just had single battery setups like me. They didn't have dual battery setups. And every time they do their rear steer, you could see the voltage gauge drop. I mean, there's like a huge amp draw on the system with that. So I decided to stay away from that. Um, I ran into a couple of guys that were running dual pumps in the system, dual TC pumps. And they seemed really happy with it. I mean, it was fast. They could do front and rear at the same time. You know, they had a good argument that uh, if your front steering went out, you could still get off the trail with your rear steering, you know, but uh, I just don't have the room in my buggy to do that. I mean, it's twice the pump, twice the reservoirs, uh, twice the lines in the system. You know, not only do I not have the space to do it, but doing that would cost me double, so... I think a good compromise was I talked to a lot of guys that were running single pump systems and the ones that were happy with it were running this awesome uh, high flow CBR pump that uh, does 1800 PSI and I believe this runs uh, you know between six and seven gallons per minute flow too so it flows it has a higher PSI and it flows way better than the TC, the TC pump I had on it before. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, take the TC pump I have in there out right now and uh, put in this uh, high flow CBR pump. And now I'm going to press the new pulley onto the pump. And remember, don't use a hydraulic press or don't be one of those idiots that try to hammer it on. You'll completely ruin it, man. I mean, I've seen these things. The shafts pop out the back from people trying to press the pulleys on with hydraulic presses. So basically you're just going to fit it on there. And remember the snout goes on the outside. You're going to screw this in the middle of the shaft. Remember those threads in the middle of the shaft on these things are made for installing and removing this pulley. So I got that on. I'm going to put my trusty dusty ratcheting wrench on there and it's as simple as getting it on there oh and i forgot to show you before i put that shaft on there i used some of my trusty grease on the shaft and on the inside the hole for the uh for the pulley so let's get that on there and this pulley install tool something you can get really cheap at autozone i think i ordered mine on amazon It really is that easy. Since I decided to use a single pump system, this is the diagram I'm using for all my hose routing. 
And uh, this diagram can be uploaded from PSC's website. Hose size is very important and can have positive and negative effects on your system. Hose size must be in sync with your system's needs. And I'm going to be using one of these uh, PSC directional control valves right here. And this is the newer designs that they sell, made by uh, Boucher Hydraulics, made in Italy. And uh, these are an upgrade over the previous models they used to sell. You know, it's got a nice adjustable pressure relief valve and everything on it. And uh, the joystick can be mounted vertically or horizontally on it, so it's easy to mount. So this is pretty much what I'm going to use to control my rear steer. Okay, so, you know, basically you already know my build plan here is I'm going to run 12 in line feeding my reservoir to my pump. Um, and then uh, 80 in line out of the pump and also 8 in line into the reservoir. But the lines I run to my actual rams are going to be 6 in line. In the and since I love these reusable fittings so much on my high pressure lines, I'm going to go ahead and show you how easy it is to install them properly. The first thing you're going to need is some soft jaws for your vise. Because, uh, you know, you're going to have to clamp it really good and you don't want to destroy your hose or fittings. You know, they make things like these specifically made to hold AN fittings. But, you know, after using these for a while, in retrospect, I don't really like these. My favorite soft jaws for the vise are these uh, cheap plastic ones from, looks like JCL products that I ordered off of uh, Amazon. I don't know if you could see that. You know, they're pretty cheap, just a few dollars on Amazon, but I really like these soft jaws the best because they're made out of a very hard plastic, not a soft plastic. So they don't deform they hold just as good as iron jaws do, but they don't destroy or mar the finish of what you're holding. So I really like these. Of course, they have magnets and just slip right on. And that's what I like. And when I cut this hose, I like to, I find that the cleanest cuts are with an angle grinder with a cutoff wheel on it. Really, I don't think uh, anything I have, including my cable cutters, Cut as clean as these on this hose. The next item you need is lubricant, grease or oil, to lube up the fittings and the hose for an easy and proper installation. The first thing I do when I get one of these reusable fittings is I screw it in all the way, just to make sure it screws in all the way. You know, once in a while, nobody's perfect, not even Eaton or Aeroquip, and once in a while you'll get a fitting where the threads are maybe boogered up a little bit and you might need to chase those threads, but always try it out first. Make sure the threads are good. So next you're gonna separate the fitting. You're gonna put that in your vise. Nice and snug. It doesn't need to be so tight you deform the fitting though. Just nice and snug. Next I'm going to grab my hose and you know it's beneficial if you don't have a dedicated hose, good hose cutter um, to cut this with a uh, angle grinder with a cutoff disc. You know you want that you don't want this deformed. What I like to do is I like to stick a round file in there and uh, kind of rough it out and smooth it up a little bit and uh, kind of chamfer the inside edge of this a little bit so it fits a little bit better. And then after I do that, I'm going to get a dab of grease. And I'm going to grease up some of the outside of this hose a little bit here. So a little light layer of grease there. Don't need a whole lot. And we're ready to put this in the fitting. 
Okay, so with that greased up, we're ready to put it in this fitting. Be mindful when you screw this hose into this fitting, it's counterclockwise. Put that in there. And look in there to visibly inspect that the hose has bottomed out on the inside lip of the fitting. And once that's the case, I put it back in the vise. And I back it off about a quarter to a third of a turn. And that part's done. And now I'm going to show you an alternate way of putting these reusable fittings on. Sometimes your hoses are just too damn long. I mean, if you're running, uh, making a rear steer hose, for instance, and your uh, directional control valve is on your dashboard and you have to run a line all the way to the ram on your rear axle, that's just too long of a damn hose to push the hose into the fitting and twist it in. So this is an alternative method I use on longer hoses, basically, I clamp the hose into the soft jaws, you know, not too tight. You don't want to damage the, uh, the uh, braiding on the hose, but just clamp it in then put the fitting on the top, then grab the appropriate size socket, put it on the fitting. And remember with this fitting right here, counterclockwise is tightened. So I have it set for that and kind of hold the hose and push down on the wrench. See, it screws right on. It goes right in. Go all the way down until you feel it bottom. And I felt it bottom there. Then it's always a great idea to have a flashlight handy so you can make sure the fitting bottomed out. And it looks like I actually have a little bit more to go there. I'm going to give this a couple more cranks. And it's bottomed out now. So that's just an alternative method for doing it. I know most hose guys prefer to twist the hose on by hand into the fitting, but like I said, sometimes your hoses are just too damn long, and this alternative method uh, works out better for you. Okay, so the next thing you're going to do, you know, put that back in the vise lightly making sure you don't crush the fitting, but it's in there nice and tight. You're gonna get this piece. You're gonna oil that up nice and good, grease it up. Remember, you need to grease this. Don't miss that step. Push it into the hose until you start grabbing threads. And this is clockwise to tighten on this piece. And once you get it to grab and it's threading in, it's time to grab a wrench. And I personally prefer a ratcheting wrench for this part. I usually put a little bit of pressure on the top and start threading it in. Now you'll notice on a lot of these as you're threading it in, the fitting starts getting a little hot. It's not a big deal, just keep going. Don't stop till you're there. Remember, these are really fine threads, so it takes a little while to bottom out on it. It's 
See what I'm doing? I'm putting thumb pressure on the top and turning the wrench. And there you have it, a completed reusable fitting, ready to run hydraulic steering. Oh, and before I forget, a last and very important step. Is to clear your hose out with compressed air really good. You do not want little pieces of rubber and debris floating around in there. You know, in the hydraulic world, cleanliness is godliness. You need to keep these clean. So next we'll delve into the world of push lock fittings. Probably the biggest mistake I see with people putting these things together is they don't lube them properly. You know, I just give them a little dip in grease right there. And, you know, most of these... You can use your muscle and force it on. If not, you know, you could put it on a flat surface like this and just uh, work it onto there like that. But, uh, you know, these are pretty easy to put in. And, you know, if you're using a thicker hose or a hose rated for higher pressures, you know, sometimes you got to put the edge of these in and kind of work them around and, and work them in there a little bit. But uh, they're not too hard. Also, if you plan on using hose clamps, a lot of the times slip that hose clamp on first before you do this, but just show you kind of how easy this is. And there you go. A properly installed push lock fitting. And this is pretty much how I run mine. A uh, dash 12 feed line, a dash eight return line, And uh, dash six to the Rams. Well, I'm mocking up my hydraulic lines and how I'm going to route them. And uh, I'll go ahead and uh, get this jack right here and jack this up, take the jack stands out and flex it out and put it at full droop and bump and make sure nothing binds. Well, let's try the rear steer out. It appears to be working. So it's now it's time to route brake lines and I'm going to route, route my brake line to the rear, my main brake line, along this upper control arm. You can see I bolted a dash 3 T right there so I can run lines to both sides. And basically what I plan on doing is, uh, you know, connecting this along here. like that to the brake calipers so I'm gonna go ahead and uh, drill and tap some holes right here so I can uh, use these little rubberized hose clamps right there to uh, mount my brake lines up and I'm using these awesome Russell chromed adapters and it basically adapts this banjo to uh, a dash 3 fitting right here so I can run all my lines, buy them uh, pre-sized and with just a regular straight end and plumb everything in. Just remember, when you put these on, 
when you're test fitting and everything, don't tighten this bolt down because once you tighten this bolt down all the way, these copper washers in here are basically one-time use washers. And every time you torque this down to torque specs, you basically ruin these washers. They basically, uh, it scores in the sealing surface, so you can't reuse them again. So don't tighten these down until last. And I uh, drilled a couple holes here for the brake line clamps. And uh, you can see I'm carefully threading this out to uh, accept quarter 20 bolts. Of course, using uh, some good cutting fluid on it and going real slow. So uh, let's get that done. And now you gotta see if your measurements came out right and if your brake line binds. So let's give it a shot here. That's at full lock. You can see I still got a little bit of slack in there. So that's good. Then at full lock the other way. It's not hitting anything, looks good. Well, as you can see right here, that's uh, how the brake lines look right there. It's going to be on each axle like this. Pretty comfortable with that. That's what I'm going to run. So I got my reupholstered seats and my new harnesses in. This is the like third reupholstering shop I've tried in town here. And uh, this shop did a pretty shitty job too, but I mean... I guess it's functional. But the harnesses look really nice. So, got my in cab controls and everything's done. I mean, from a control standpoint, I'm ready to rock out. Well, you probably noticed part two of my uh, 14 bolt rear steer video. It's taken a long time to release. Well, that's because basically uh, I ordered my RCVs, my custom RCVs for the rear. Uh, back in, you know, beginning of June, and I was told it'd be four to six weeks. Well, um, when it was eight weeks, you know, I understood I'll give them a couple weeks leeway, you know, with COVID and everything going on. So when it hit eight weeks, I called, oh, we're running behind on 300 M. Sorry, sir. Blah, blah, blah. You know, then it was nine weeks, then 10 weeks, then 11 weeks, then 12 weeks. And I'm sitting on almost 13 weeks now, and I still haven't gotten them. But in, uh, I guess you'd say, uh, August, one of my buddies uh, told me, yeah, I just ordered axle shafts from Brannock, and I called them, and they told me five-day turnaround. And I'm like, well, these are custom shafts. You know, they have to, this is a 14-bolt rear steer. These shafts are fully custom down to the axle ceiling surface. And he said, no, mine are custom too. It's for rear steer. They told me five days. So I called up Brannock and they told me, you know, as long as I get the regular chromoly with CTMs, it's a five day turnaround. So I ordered my, I gave them my axle specs ordered from Brannock and man, they were dirt cheap, great price. And they told me five day turnaround, they'd make it and ship in five days. Well, I waited, I'd say almost four weeks on those before I finally got them. But I did get them, and uh, you know they look pretty good. I test fitted them in there. The splines line up. Everything looks good. Uh, I got to put them together. They came with the CTMs in a box, so I got to get all that handled. And it looks like I'm gonna make Trail Hero. But uh, what a clusterfuck! This is a project I thought I was gonna have done by the middle of July, and here we are. You know, the middle of uh, September. And you know, I'm just I'm trying to dig into this project and finish it. So that's one thing I hate about the damn off-road industry. No one does what they say they're gonna do. I mean, and it's everybody. Axle manufacturers, if you order pumps, unit bearings, uh shocks, it doesn't matter. They all lie to you. And that's one thing I hate about this damn industry is you know, everybody they figure, well, if I tell them the truth, they're gonna go somewhere else. So They'd rather just lie to you and, you know, they almost plan on you calling saying, hey, what's the status of my order? And 
giving you some bullshit excuse, but I hate that about the off-road industry. I wish a company would step up and just tell you the truth. If it's going to be, if it's going to be a four-month wait, tell me it's going to be a four-month wait. Don't tell me it's going to be two weeks. And don't think I'm being mean and bitter and just hating on RCV and throwing them under the bus. It's literally everything. It was ORI, even, uh, you know, Brannett, you know, they, even Brannett told me five days and, you know, it was over three weeks to get their stuff. But I mean, it was everything with this build from the guy who did my drive line and told me I could have it in two days and it took three weeks to the uh, upholster on my seats that told me one week and it took three weeks to uh, PSC. I mean, I ordered my directional control valve from them and they said it was on the shelf over there in stock and that took me almost a month to get. So, I mean, it was literally everything with this. Every part I ordered, the vendor lied to me about the status of the order or whether it was in stock or when the ship date on it was going to be. I just, one of these days I'm going to open up my own off-road business and I'm going to make it a policy to be honest with the customer because no one is right now. Got my CTMs ready to rock and roll here. You haven't installed these. They're kind of a pain in the ass. They're always a super tight fit. You know, and hopefully I don't have to do any clearancing. Especially sometimes I've noticed on these for the Dana 60s, sometimes these don't really fit in aftermarket knuckles and you end up having to do some clearancing on the knuckle to make them work. But hopefully I don't have to do that. Well, let's get to putting together some shafts. Make sure this taper goes to the inside. Perfect. Well, I finally got everything bolted up here. Got the Brannock axle shafts in. And as you know, these Brannock axle shafts were supposed to be my spare backup axle shafts, but uh, my RCVs still haven't come in, so I'm just going to have to rock out with these for Trail Hero and to get this build done. But, uh, Guess it's time to bleed the brakes and slap some tires on this thing and go crab walk around. And now for the most important part of this entire project is I've got to go through this entire thing. I mean, everything I did over the summer and make sure every bolt is tightened and torqued. And that goes for ram mount bolts, tie rod bolts, steering arm bolts, Kingpin bolts, shock mount bolts, link bolts, driveline bolts, uh, basically uh, brake fittings. Basically have to go through the entire thing. Hydraulic fittings. Make sure everything I did is tightened and torqued down to specs. Most important part of the project. Okay, so I almost did a super dumbass thing here. You know, I was just about to jump in my buggy, start it up, pull out of the garage and start peeling out. And I just remember 
I still haven't put any uh, fluid in the diff. So don't be a dumbass like me. Even if you think you did it, you know, if your buggy's been sitting this long because it's been a long project, check again just to make sure that you put fluid in it. Dumbass. So when it's all said and done, you're probably going to have about three and a half quarts in your 14 bolt. Maybe a little bit just past three and a half quarts. So you need to buy four quarts. And I got oil in it. So it seems to be pretty doing pretty good so far. Now I think I need to take it out to the desert here just for a day for a quick shakedown run. So one of the things I did today is I have a little GoPro mount in here and uh, I'm going to hook my GoPro up to watch my rear suspension cycle. Um, I did this to my Jeep and Becca's Jeep when I did the when I stretched the rear ends and did the suspension on that and it really told me a lot so uh, I highly recommend hooking up a GoPro to uh, the back of your chassis to watch your suspension cycle. I took my buggy up to the mountains to an off-road area that has a uh, 4x4 practice course. Hungry Valley is the perfect place to do shakedown runs because it has both artificial obstacles to flex on and lots of areas to do some really good high-speed runs as well. It's also a place where if my rig breaks down or something goes wrong with my rig, I can literally pull my trailer up right next to the buggy and put it on the trailer. And best of all, it's only 40 minutes from my house. I know what you're gonna say. These are easy obstacles that don't require rear steer, but 
I needed to use the rear steer on this shakedown run as much as possible. I needed to actually overuse the rear steer on this run. So if any problem, you know, so any problems with my build would become obvious to me and I could fix them before I take a big trip to Trail Hero in a week. Well, the only thing I noticed was that one of the lock nuts on one of my heim joints came loose, you know, and I fixed that already. I also feel like my front passenger ORI is leaking fluid from the top chamber into the lower chamber, you know, and I'm getting a little bit of hydro lock. So uh, I think I'm going to swap out that ORI with my spare ORI and uh, send the one with the seal issue back to ORI after Trail Heroes over. But overall, I'd say that I'm very happy with the build and the performance of it. And I think I'm ready for Trail Hero now. So stay tuned for my Trail Hero video in a couple of weeks so you can see how my rig does on real obstacles. And most importantly, I want you to learn from my mistakes on this project. Don't start ripping apart your buggy until all of your parts are in. You know, I missed a good four months of off-roading because I was impatient and I started tearing into this thing before my parts were in. You know, I don't care what lead time vendors give you for parts. Don't believe them. You know, you're going to have long waits on parts no matter what you think or anybody tells you. So get your parts together first. My next piece of advice is to tack your shock and link mounts up and never burn them in until your buggy's been completely flexed out to the maximum with the wheels at full lock. You know, I ended up needing to plasma cut my lower shock mounts off and re-weld them in a different position to clear the steering arm at full lock and maximum flex on that side. You know, and lastly, have a build plan before you start. You know, I made tie rod ends that <laughs> I never even used and ended up stretching my wheelbase, you know, uh, midway through the project and, you know, I paid for that. So have a good plan before you buy or do anything. You know, it'll save you money and time in the end. And where I think I surprised myself on this build was with how awesome my measurements were. You know, everything from link lengths and geometry to custom axle shaft measurements came out perfect on this build. You know, trust me, that doesn't always happen. As a matter of fact, it's more of the exception than the rule, I think. But it's really nice when it does happen. You know, uh, I was very careful with my measurements, and I think it paid off for me. So I really hope you enjoyed both of my 14 bolt rear steer build videos. And if you like my content, you know, hit subscribe. And as always, thanks for watching and keep the rubber side down.